All right. Hello, ASQ government. So wonderful you all can join us for a very riveting and very timely webinar from our presenter here, Mr. Zachary Manheimer. Today, Zachary will be presenting for us the rural community of tomorrow, how 3D printed homes can revitalize the American economy. But before he jumps into this presentation, I want to say a few words about Zach or Zachary, uh, but I, I've been calling him Zach lately, so I hope he's okay with that, but Zachary Manheimer, who is the founder and CEO of Alpha 3D and Atlas Community Studios. Zach grew up in rural Holland in Southeast Pennsylvania, and by the time he graduated high school, Holland was sucked into the Philadelphia Metro and lost its identity to suburbia. Armed with degrees in theater and philosophy from Mullenberg College in Allentown, he had zero job prospects so he moved to London to pursue theater. Two years later, his visa expired, and he did what every other American theater major does, he moved to New York City. Zach spent eight years in Brooklyn running theater companies and working in restaurants who determined that New York City didn't need another theater or restaurant. And he looked around to see that he was in a homogeneous bubble. Knowing there are many people who thought differently than he did. He went on a 22 city road trip across America over the summer of 2007 and settled in Des Moines, Iowa. Knowing no one, and I mean no one in Iowa, Zach got to work meeting as many artists as he could in order to find and found what is Des Moines Social Club in 2009, which is a nonprofit arts and education center that hosted thousands of arts related events. So spring forward to 2020, Zach, along with his partners, created Atlas Community Studios, a wholly independent place-making and economic development group. Zach founded Alpha 3, 3D at the same time in order to solve the rural housing crisis. Alpha 3D is printing affordable housing across this nation, starting with the first owner-occupied 3D home in the world in Virginia. He serves on the boards of Iowa Public Radio and the Iowa Rural Development Council. He lives with his wife, Sarah, and their three kids, Mira, Benjamin, and Fiona, in Iowa City. Zach is an opinion contributor for The Hill, and his work has been written about in the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, Axios, Time Magazine, Architecture Digest, The Independent, Politico, The Atlantic, and dozens of community publications. Zach loves exploring rural communities, producing new pieces of theater, creating restaurant concepts, and has an unhealthy relationship with the Philadelphia Eagles. ASQ government, if you will, please welcome Zachary Manheimer. Well, thank you so much, Vincent. I, I appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to get right into it here. Uh, hopefully, everybody can see that. Uh, I'm going to move this over here. Um, so, my name is Zach Manheimer. I am the uh, CEO and founder of Alquist uh, 3D and Atlas Community Studios. We are working in many locations around the country, but what I want to talk about today is the vision that we see for how we can solve the housing crisis and how we can revitalize many communities. And what we're seeing right now is that our belief is that rural America is the next place to innovate. And we believe that primarily because if there's any, any overall trend that's been happening right now in, uh, with the pandemic, it's this trend of COVID migration, of pandemic migration, of people leaving one area and wanting to go to another, specifically uh, to go to a smaller community. And we're seeing this all the time. Every single day, another article comes out, and there's article after article after article that talks about this migration pattern and where people are going and why they're going there and what's gonna happen when they get there. But when we get to a point where a place like Spokane, Washington is too expensive, we know that we've got problems. And this is what's really interesting that's following all of this is that for the first time in decades, major cities lost population in the last year. Primarily, one of the biggest reasons why, of course, was because of housing. Uh, it's incredibly challenging to find housing wherever you live, but in uh, urban spaces, that challenge has been uh, has just eclipsed any issue that's ever happened in the past uh, two decades. So this is not necessarily new, though. 
for the last 50 years, people have been leaving the coast, they've been oversaturated, and they're going to uh, smaller communities and cities more on the inland of our country. And you can see the rural population loss of people leaving rural and going to those places and now going back play out in this map. For the past 50 years, uh, the rural loss uh, has been dramatic. You can also see it play out in our congressional map. Uh, people are leaving the Northeast, they're going south, and they're going west. This is a map of where they went between 2000 and 2007. Folks largely went to what we call second cities. Minneapolis, Kansas City, Nashville, Austin, Denver, Miami, New Orleans, Phoenix. These are the cities that gained population per capita at identical rates as a place like San Francisco saw 100 years ago. Same exact pattern. But today, we believe that we're in the rise of the third city. And those are cities that are squarely fit a population between 200,000 and 500,000. This is Des Moines, Iowa, Boise, Idaho, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Madison, Wisconsin, Little Rock, Arkansas, Birmingham, Alabama, Raleigh, North Carolina. Those are the cities today gaining population at the same rates as San Francisco 100 years ago per capita. So there's no difference. And before COVID, this was the trend. And we used to say that sometime around 2030 to 2035, these third cities would be approaching saturation levels like the coasts, and people would begin moving to more rural areas and smaller areas back when everybody, or when, when everybody could be doing video chats and working remotely. Uh, obviously, all of that changed. The remote work revolution is shifting a lot of this mentality, but we're also in an unprecedented time. People are no longer going from first city to second city and so forth. And it's largely because of this three-headed monster of migration that we're seeing. You have economic migration. That's always been true. You've got pandemic uh, COVID-based migration, people wanting to live in less dense places. And then you've got climate migration, people not wanting to live around where there's natural disasters all the time, whether that's hurricanes, flooding, fire, et cetera. People want to be living in safer locations. And what's really driving a lot of this is that we're not seeing any more people going from first city to second city. People are going from first city to sixth city, city and everything in between. And what's the big piece behind this is that for the first time ever in modern human history, people don't have to be attached to a major city to experience the best arts and culture, the best business or educational opportunities. You can do it from anywhere, but that means that you have to have a strong broadband signal and of course you have to have an appropriate home to live in. So this is at the base. So we believe in rural areas and smaller communities uh, because of this rural hierarchy of needs that we see here. And this is, these pieces are necessary for any community to grow. But what's at the base is housing, always. It doesn't matter how great your community is if you don't have anywhere to live. That's really always what we're looking at here. So as these pen, uh, these, uh, the migration patterns shift, rural areas stand to grow but they have to have the right housing and broadband. So if we see this opportunity, we have to take a hold of it. So here's the basic problem. Every time a home increases by $1,000, we displace over 150,000 American families. That is the root issue that we're seeing here. And so Alquis, we believe that there's only two ways to solve the housing problem. Number one, companies need to pay their employees more so they can afford the rising cost of home building, or the cost of home building needs to come down or ideally both. But since we have no control over what companies are going to do, we focused on the second one and we searched for a long time to figure out what we can do. And we believe that 3D printing is not the only answer, but it's one answer to helping to drop the cost of housing across the board so we can get to a more sustainable place. We believe that 3D printing is going to be able to save at least 30% versus stick built in the next two years. And that's not there yet, we're not there yet today, but that's where we're heading. So we created Alquist 3D specifically to meet those demands. Uh, housing is the number one issue in every single community across America, whether it's uh, urban or rural, suburban, everybody has this crunch. So the pillars of our community that we believe in, we believe in community. We don't wanna recreate Levittown here. Every community and home we build is going to be unique. Uh, we believe in affordability. A house is a home well before it's an asset. Uh, we believe in sustainability. These homes need to last and they need to uh, lower our carbon output and our electricity, uh, which I'll we'll go through in a minute. And we believe in technology, not just to print the home, but inside the home as well. So we all know the inventory for homes for sale are at historic lows. Meanwhile, prices are eclipsing $400,000 as a median home price nationally. This is not sustainable. Something has to be done. 
You pair on top of this the, the demand for people wanting homes. Most people today would rather go on Zillow than do a lot of other things, like this last bullet here that I won't uh, mention. I'll just leave this here for your viewing pleasure. So here's what's really interesting, is that 3D printing is, of concrete is not necessarily new. This is a video we found uh, from 1934. This is basically the same way that we print homes today using a machine like this, except we can move much faster and we're not standing on scaffolding, dumping the material directly into the hopper. Uh, we can do it in a much more uh, efficient manner, but this is basically the same way that we're doing it. But our hope, the way that we know that we will be successful, is if we can really get the choreography down of these three guys when we finish one of our homes. We can do this, then I think we have finally made it. This is the long-term goal. So. First, our first home that we ever finished was for a collaboration with Habitat for Humanity. This was in Williamsburg, Virginia. This home became the first owner-occupied 3D printed home in the world uh, in Williamsburg, uh, Virginia. And this is the home right here. It is a 1,300 square foot, three bed, two bath, single story slab on grade home. We printed the exterior walls of the home and the rest of the home was built completely traditionally. And that's important to know that there's the only difference between a 3D printed home and a regular home are the walls are printed in concrete, everything else is the same. We still need plumbers, electricians, HVAC folks, carpenters, et cetera, to come out and build out the home. None of that is changing except for the framing of the home. The inside of the home looks like any other home. Walking in here, you would never know that this home was 3D printed. Uh, here's a short video of the home being printed. Beautiful day. We couldn't have done any better for. I know. So what you're seeing there is the exterior wall of the home being printed. There's two whites on the exterior wall system. Each white is two inches wide with a four-inch gap. Inside that gap is where we insulate. We use closed cell spray foam, just like most homes do. Uh, you can put your electrical and plumbing directly into that gap as well. When we're done with the wall system, we seal it with a bond beam and the roof attaches directly to that bond beam. And then we go about building out the rest of the home as normal as you would any other home. So some facts and figures about the Habitat home. First of all, it took us 22 hours to print the exterior wall systems of that home. Based on that and based on Habitat's uh, numbers, since they were the general contractor on this and the developer, they believe that we saved them about 10 to 15% versus what they would normally have spent if they had built this home traditionally. It knocked off about three weeks from the construction process. This home is Earthcraft certified. Uh, also, we have put Raspberry Pi technology inside every wall system. This is a sensor system that's tracking your air quality, smoke alarm system. It can be your security system for the home as well. It's also sending real-time data back to the homeowner and our partners at Virginia Tech so they can continue to study the, uh, how the home operates. And it's been there for preventative damage. It's monitoring if there's any ever moisture buildup or any vibration in the walls. Thankfully, nothing has gone wrong uh, so far. And everything is working really well. But we're going to be putting all of those sensor systems inside every home that Alquist Prince sells. So our second home was in Richmond, Virginia, just up the road. This home was completed just last month. Uh, the print was last summer and was completed last month. Uh, we built this in collaboration with Virginia Tech, Virginia Housing, Better Homes and Better Housing Coalition, and RMT Construction was our contractor. Uh, this is the home. This is, now, this is a 15 and 1,550 square foot, three bed, two bath, single story slab on grade home, so slightly bigger than the Habitat home. Uh, this is now the second home in the world to be 3D printed and be owner occupied. Uh, this home, we did not smooth the concrete on the exterior walls like the Habitat home. So you have this layered look that is pretty traditional when it comes to 3D printing, but we can smooth the wall system so it looks almost like stucco, like the Habitat home. Uh, we have a new printer, a uh, new company that we're partnering with. They're called Black Buffalo 3D. This is their printer here. This is a test that we did a couple weeks ago in Pulaski, Virginia. Uh, this is what the uh, print looks like if we don't smooth the wall systems. This printer is enormous. It runs on a track system, so we can print multiple homes at a time. This printer is also capable of going up three stories. Now, we haven't done that yet. Nobody has in America yet, but we plan on printing uh, going vertical next year. Uh, some advantages to 3D printing. And again, I want to ver uh, just put forward here that 3D printing with concrete is a brand new industry. 
There's a lot that we don't know. There's only six companies in America doing this work. There's only 10 homes uh, that have been, ever been printed in America. Two of them are ours. And so this is a very uh, infant industry that we are creating as we go. But here's what we know. First of all, there's a time reduction. We can knock about two to four weeks off the framing of a home. To print a 1,500 square foot home, it takes us about 20 to 25 hours to print the exterior walls. Secondly, a labor uh, scenario. Uh, technically, you only need two humans to operate the printer. Today, we're using four. By the end of next year, once training gets to where it needs to be, we will only be using two people and you're going to knock a ton of cost on, down on labor. Then material, the cost of the concrete is far less than the cost of lumber. You add all that up and that's where your savings come today on the front end of this, of this work. Uh, but then on the back end, we have other types of savings. We know that thanks to a Virginia Tech study, a 3D concrete home uses 50% less energy than a stick bill home. So you're cutting your energy bill in half right out of the gate. We have 80% less waste on site than versus stick built. The design is much more flexible uh, for these types of homes and we can customize very easily. Uh, the life cycle of the homes are anticipated to last 175 years. Remember, this is concrete. It's not any special concrete. It can be special concrete and we reinforce it. That would all only be the difference, but it's concrete. We've been building concrete structures for hundreds of years all over the world. These, these homes last. Uh, the durability of these homes is pretty amazing. Uh, we believe they can withstand tornado, hurricanes, fire, flooding, and uh, ballistics. But we have to do further studies. So we can't say that definitively just yet. We have three different grants going on right now with different universities where we will have those answers this time next year. But we believe uh, all of these things will be true. We just have to prove it. And then from a local code standpoint, there's no problem. We passed all local codes everywhere that we're printing. Uh, once folks understand that it's concrete and we show them how it works, they tend to get on board very quickly. Now, it's important to know that with a 3D concrete home, and your mind thinks about it, you can think about all different shapes and sizes and curved walls and futuristic designs, and we can do all that. But it was important to us in the beginning that we print homes that look like homes, that look like any other home, so that we can really get this to become commercially viable. So here's how it works. First off, you have your architect as a design in CAD software. That design is then transferred over to a G-code in Slicer software, which is the software that talks directly to the printer. We mix all of our concrete on site. So we pour uh, the raw material through a silo that hits the pump system on site. That's where it mixes with water and is pumped directly through a hose to the print nozzle and we print out the home layer after layer. So we received tons of uh, positive press from all over the world about this, uh, so much so that today we get anywhere from 25 to 30 requests per hour for 3D homes from all over the world. It's been this way since Christmas. It's uh, way too much work than we can possibly take on, so that's why we're encouraging more groups to get into this work. Now, I want to mention why we're called Alquist. Uh, as you heard in the beginning, uh, thanks to uh, Vincent's great introduction, my background's in theater. And Alquist is a name of a character from a 1920 Czechoslovakia play that no one's ever heard of uh, called R.U.R. And the, this is the first piece of literature that coined the term robot. This is where robot comes from. The plot of the show is like any other science fiction movie or book you've ever seen or read. Uh, man invents robots to speed up his manufacturing plant. The robots don't like how they're being treated. They rise up, they revolt, they kill all the humans. Spoiler alert. But there's one human who is spared, and that's Alquist because he is the only person in the play who believes that humans and robots can coexist together peacefully. So he's spared by the robots and charged with rebooting the human race. So that's the play, uh, but we're called that as a reminder to ourselves that we, that we are using automation to replace human jobs with robots, which is why we have to have a robust workforce development strategy to help complement this. And so we are working with Virginia Tech right now to create a curriculum. This will be ready next year. We're going to offer this curriculum to any community college uh, or high school in the areas where we're printing. And it'll be a certificate program with no pre prerequisite needed. Anybody can be a, become a new skill or reskill to learn how to become a certified 3D concrete printer. And companies like ours will hire them directly. There's major demand for this, but there is not a program nationally. And we want to start when folks are really young, like super young, like 10 and under. We want to get them on the job site and I'm kidding. These are my kids. So here's where we are printing currently and where we will be printing. Right now, we are printing in Virginia. Uh, we're soon to be printing in Iowa and Florida. 
Uh, the other states here are the ones that we're all talking to right now that we plan on printing over the next uh, three years. Uh, we are in an investment round right now, so we're scaling, and the more that we can scale, the easier it'll be to get this done. We just announced Project Virginia, which has become the largest 3D printed uh, project in the world. The plan is to print 200 homes throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia over the next four to five years. Nothing like this has ever been attempted. Uh, we're starting in on this work in the next month, and we're going to be producing about 10 homes this year, and next year there's going to be many more in several different communities throughout Virginia. So we have a couple of strategic partnerships that we're working on. First of all, Atlas Community Studios is my other group. This is how we got into this work. Atlas is an economic development and creative placemaking and master planning group. So Atlas gives us the connections to the communities throughout the country. This is a map of where Atlas has been working over the past 10 years. We work very closely with the community uh, on how to get the land ready to go and exactly what types of homes should be printed, the price points, et cetera, how to finance it, all of those pieces. We work directly with Atlas to help us figure that out. Uh, Black Buffalo is our partner who is our printer manufacturer and our material supplier. Uh, Maverick Solar Panels, they make solar grid panels for, the, for roofs. Uh, they also make batteries and EV chargers for homes. So we can now make these homes net zero. And then we have a development arm that we work with as well. We're working with the National Building Museum to do a big exhibit next year, which is exciting. And then we've made an agreement with Habitat for Humanity to print at least one home with them every single year in the Williamsburg, Virginia area. Finally, we're offering licenses. Because we're getting so much demand and we're small and we can't be everywhere, we're working with several different construction companies and communities that would like to get into 3D printing, but they don't want to have to go through what we went through. It's taken us six years and two and a half million dollars to get to where we are today with this knowledge. And so we're now offering that to any of these uh, construction companies or communities that want to get into them. If this is of interest to anybody, reach out to me and we can start talking about how to get you a license. So the future for where we see things moving forward, first of all, uh, just as a reminder, people tend to go, innovative people tend to go to urban areas. Uh, there's no reason to do that anymore. You can go anywhere. But that means we have to have the right housing and broadband and other amenities in all communities that are throughout our country. We believe that 3D printed homes are going to become uh, the norm in the next 10 years, primarily in rural areas. We believe solar power is going to take over also in rural areas. We also are going to be not just 3D printing the houses, but 3D printing everything inside the home as well. Every Alquist home comes with your own personal 3D printer built into your kitchen, just like your microwave. What you see it printing here is a light switch cover that looks like this. That light switch cover took 45 minutes to print and cost 17 cents. In the future, we don't believe that you, when something breaks or you wanna change the look of something in your home, you're not gonna to go to Lowe's or Home Depot anymore. You're gonna go online, you're gonna download a file, and you're gonna print it out yourself, and you're, gonna, and you're going to install it yourself. This is the future of home repair and renovation. And we are starting with small things like doorknobs and drawer pulls and, and light switch covers, but soon we'll be printing kitchen cabinetry, your kitchen island, your stairwell, your furniture, your clothing on the rack, the food in the fridge. All of it can be 3D printed, and we're looking into all of that work in the next couple of years. So that's our approach to 3D printing uh, home renovation and repair. Finally, uh, we're getting into new materials. Concrete's great, but it's far from the most sustainable material. We want to get greener. So eventually we want to get away from concrete altogether. And so we're working with several different universities to study whether we can use hemp to make a hempcrete, whether we can use recycled materials like glass and plastic, or whether we can even use fly coal ash, which there is millions of pounds of in Appalachia. Can we reuse that material inside our 3D material to make a home? That's the research we're doing over the next two years. We believe 15 million Americans are on the move right now, all looking for new places to live, work, and play. They're going to decide where they go by the end of 2023. We need to move on this now, especially if we want our communities to grow. This is a list of some rural communities I've personally visited just in the last year. And what's interesting is that there's no difference whether you're in Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania, or Sparta, North Carolina. The exact same problem exists in all of these places, and that is housing. This is the grand equalizer that brings us together. <clears throat> and I'd like to close with a quote from one of my mentors, Richard Florida, and he says, the remote work revolution promises to change the way that Americans work and live. 
that will allow smaller cities, suburbs, and rural areas to compete with the superstar cities on the basis of price and amenities. It will shift the main thrust of economic development from paying incentives to big employers to investing in building up a community's quality of life. As communities attract more remote workers, their tax bases will grow, allowing them to improve schools and public services, benefiting everyone. Eventually, companies will come too. That holds out the possibility of a better, virtuous circle of economic development. I could not agree more. That is exactly the work that we're trying to do. And thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. Wow, thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Vincent. Yeah. Thank you, Zach. Um, I, will, I will have to admit, you, you have did a presentation for, uh, for me just now in which I have very few questions which means that <laughs> it was very comprehensive. So that is a compliment, um, as I normally tear people's things apart. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I do have a few questions, um, but uh, I wanted to say great, great presentation. So I want to move into the QA portion um, with our current attendees. So let me know when you're ready for that. I'm ready. All right, so uh, fellow attendees, if you have any questions, please utilize the Q&A chat button. Um, uh, to the right panel of your screen here, and we can go ahead and jump in from there. Um, and when those come through, we can go ahead and read them all for you. But I had a few uh, to ask you uh, myself, because uh, I figured you'd be very comprehensive. So I said, let me throw a little zinger in there and see. Um, you mentioned that you all are currently uh, in the R&D phase working with new materials, okay? So I see that you're working with concrete. Hold on one moment. This is my dog about to bother me. Hold on. Sorry about that. Uh, he hears me on this presentation. Um, so besides concrete, and I think I saw some things um, mentioned such as hemp and graphene and things of that nature, um, have you all started working with any 3D printing around um, uh, metals or even simple metals as part of housing? We have not, but others have. And so we are planning on, and part of our investment round here is to get the, the funding in order to purchase several of those metal printers. That is one of our goals. So we're hoping that next year we're going to be printing in metal and glass in addition to uh, concrete. Oh, I think you're on mute there, Vincent. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, so we do have a question coming through. It says, is there a limit to the square footage for the homes that can be 3D printed? Technically, no. Uh, there is a limit with only by the printer itself. So the printer, we have two printers. We have a Cobod printer and we have a Black Buffalo printer. Uh, both of them were really limited by the Cobod is a, can only do a 40 by 40. Uh, the uh, Buffalo, because it's on a track system, you can easily add tracks and you are limited by 40 foot width, but length you can go much further with the track system. That being said, there's no problem in doing the bunny hop, which is what we use in the uh, industry term, where you could print and pause the print, move the printer over, and then continue printing, and you can increase your size. Uh, it's certainly not efficient, but two years, uh, I think realistically in two years, there will be new printers on the market that allow you so much more flexibility in terms of size. Awesome. I think that's also a good segue question too as well. Um, considering that you all have been building single family homes at the moment within the various uh, municipalities around this country, does Alquist have a, um, uh, does have any desire, I guess you would say, to build what they call um, accessory dwelling units or ADUs? ADUs, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. have you all started into that area? We do have some designs for ADUs right now, and ADUs uh, typically are under 800 square feet. Uh, the best thing to do for those is the other type of printer, which is a robot arm printer. They are much lighter, less expensive, easier to maneuver, and so that's something else we're going to be purchasing here later this year. The robot arms can easily do ADUs. Uh, you're going to start seeing many of those sprout up. Nice. And I was going to ask, too, as well, because considering if you were doing ADUs in a single-family home, and you mentioned that one of the uh, 3D printers can go up three stories. Um, so what about the idea of, um, I guess you would say, affordable housing and say apartment units or condos and things of that nature? 
Yeah, multifamily. Thank you. That's the word I look for. Yes, we want to we want to get into that as well. So nobody globally, nobody's ever printed above one story in America, and it's only been done twice globally: once in Dubai and once in Germany. They printed two story structures. So this is still early on, but technically the printers can do it. Uh, this is a structural question that we mm -hmm. are going through with many different structural engineers right now to figure out the best way possible. My suspicion is that by next summer we and others will have the uh, the tools to do a uh, multi-story structure. Awesome. We have another question here, Zachary. It says, with the recyclable inputs, um, are you working with state or federal government on housing rebates uh, when sell let me start over. With recyclable inputs, are you working with state or federal government on housing rebates when selling like electrical, I mean, electric vehicles? Oh, yes. Um, so we, we uh, our homes can easily come with an EV charger at no cost to the, to the uh, customer. So that's no problem. And so, yes, you would get a rebate uh, by putting that into your home. Okay, nice. Okay. Um, let's see, we got more here. Uh, da, da, da. You mentioned the part about the uh, testing that's still going on as it relates to like a reliability analysis around 3D printing homes. So more to come on that with Virginia Tech. Um, but considering that the Biden administration has announced in May of 2022 a housing supply action plan to address housing shortages, um, and I know you mentioned things about helping with finance. Um, so does Alcos believe that? Uh, Single-family homes, uh, small uh, apartment buildings, and things of that nature. Give me a moment here. Got to make sure I got it right. I'm trying to read this question. Will Alpha 3D work with those homes um, to work in financing and in alignment with, say, the Housing Supply Action Plan? Uh, short, the, short, short answer is yes. Uh, long answer is that those programs typically provide funds on the front end to the home buyer to either reduce their overall cost or most likely to help them with down payment assistance. Uh, so, so yes, so our homes are sold like any other home. You get a traditional mortgage from a bank. Uh, so th there's really nothing different. So any of those programs that exist today, we can participate with. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see. Are there any more questions? Uh, yeah, uh, this is Larry. I'll, I'll, um, I ask, I'll ask a question um, about um, the training that that you have coming with the uh, community colleges, uh, the eight week course. Um, I believe you said that there were no prerequisites in in order to enter those programs. Um, how? Are there major community colleges or, or um, universities that you're already starting to line up with, and when will it roll out? Uh, yes, we're, hope, we're hoping to roll this out fall of 23. So we're putting the curriculum together now. We're creating it, uh, and we're going to start testing it uh, in closed areas next spring. And assuming it all comes together, uh, next fall is probably when you'll start seeing this being offered at schools. Great. Okay, and piggyback on that one, uh, being that um, if it's particularly if it's community colleges, community colleges are generally aligned with uh, states and state budgets. So, uh, ergo, enter, entry to the government sphere uh, to provide this training, workforce development, and ultimately housing. Um, I saw that you, there was a uh, there was quite a few states on there. Our state was state was included, North Carolina. Um, but I, I did see a, 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 I thought a cluster of opportunities in Iowa. You know, um, is there something special happening in Iowa that North Carolina needs to replicate? Uh, well, it, it, it's simply that Iowa is where I live. It's where our company is based. So uh, we, uh, we, we've moved things along a little faster here just because that's where we are. Uh, I would say that North Carolina has looked at this extensively, uh, specifically in the northwest region, up in the Blue Ridge there. Uh, there's uh, community Wilkesboro uh, with Wilkes Community College, they have taken a big step on this. They would like to be the first uh, community college that offers uh, this program. So that is coming along as well. Interesting. Uh, have you have have you and your company been in contact with uh, Central Piedmont Community College here in North Carolina? I believe it's the largest 
community college system in the state. So um, just out of curiosity, and that's where I am, um, <laughs> have you been in contact with uh, Central Piedmont? Uh, we have not, but uh, would be happy to talk with, with you or any of your colleagues about this. I mean, ultimately, we want this uh, pro uh, program to be everywhere. The, yeah. the barrier is that in order to teach this properly, they need to be in, on a job site printing. So what we're envisioning is a six or eight week course where it's mm -hmm. three to four weeks in the classroom, three to four weeks in the field. When you're in the field, they're going to be on site with us where we're printing. So that means that in order to have a program up, go up and running, assuming that a community college doesn't want to make the investment to buy a printer and start printing themselves, uh, this needs to exist around where we have existing projects. So that's probably the first uh, big thing that we have to look at. Okay, good, good, fantastic. Thank you. Other questions, Vincent? Um, there are no new. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not sure who that was. If you could speak up again. Was that Neota? I'm, I'm not sure. Possibly. Uh, Neota is currently traveling at the moment. She might be in an airport. Um, but I do not see any new. Um, questions in the chat. Um, if there are any additional questions, please put them in the Q&A chat. And while those are coming through, I would like to say that, Zach, I am, I am really impressed with the work that you all have been doing. I think it's really good. And the fact that um, you all are working with the community college system because a workforce development strategy will be very important to rolling out this technology and this skill set to help meet the housing shortage um, uh, demands around the country as well as I'm pretty sure the world, but you definitely here um, in the U.S. as we know that housing costs have risen exponentially for a lot of municipalities, whether you're living in a town, um, a, a small city, as you said, third city or things of that nature, or even some of the major cities. But overall, it's a, it's a, it's an item that is at the forefront of everyone's um, uh, knowledge bank as well as in everyone's news. So I was glad to see that you all are taking steps to to combat that as well as to um, upskill and, and provide and assist with a solution to the problem. So thank you. One last question about the uh, educational rollout um, for the workforce development. Uh, I, I see that you, you've already done work with uh, organizations like Habitat for Humanity. And uh, I know here in the local area, uh, in, in the Charlotte area, uh, there's a great deal of workforce development partnerships that uh, happen that are, uh, you know, non-government actors uh, like Habitat or um, Urban League or um, what's, the, what's the one off of uh, Wilkinson Boulevard, for instance? Oh, Goodwill Industries. Goodwill, yeah, things like that that provide that training. Are you are you planning to expand your footprint in? Uh, those kind of the certification and training opportunities through some of those networks that are not necessarily community college, but kind of pipeline into the workforce development uh, community uh, in local areas. Here uh, absolutely. Kind of absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we want to get it started with the community colleges first, and then we'll we'll we're, we'd love to talk with any of those groups. Fantastic. Great. But we do we do have another question, um, and this is uh, looking at say from economic standpoint. But with everything, I mean, with everything possibly going to printing, or let me say most things, um, so you so do you worry that the traditional provides, hold on, let me give you a moment on this one. Uh, with everything possibly going to printing, do you worry that the traditional pro, uh, providers or the traditional will provide, will cause another economic issue? I think what the person may be trying to say is uh, will, moving or shifting to printing cause uh, an economic issue on the traditional side of, say, work with uh, construction, building homes, um, and other uh, items. I think that's what the person was trying to say. If I'm saying this wrong, please come off of uh, mute and explain the question. But I think that's what they're trying to say. 
so the answer, the answer is no. Um, we have a we're we're behind by five million homes nationally. Um, this is not a technology that's going to replace other t uh, typical types of construction immediately or probably for at least 10 years. And uh, during that time cycle, we'll have plenty of time to shift. And, and remember that we still need all the other types of professions to help build out our homes. It's not just like uh, the home, and home building process goes away overnight. This is meant to be a complement and an advancement to the industry, uh, not a major disruptor. Exactly. And also, I would say with that, um, a compliment as well, uh, because as we know that like I said, there's a housing shortage, um, also different uh, areas, different cities, states, um, and, and I use the word municipalities because even towns and townships, uh, some of them have different zoning ordinances uh, that a lot of them are in the process of updating to allow for um, new types of housing to be built, uh, especially as it relates to material, size, um, and also uh, just getting the zoning correct first to even allow that. So I think those things will take time. It's not going to be like an overnight situation, but even then, like you said, it will uh, uh, it'll be a growing uh, industry. So I don't think it will replace anything. Agreed. Well, great question. Great. Let's see. Do we have any more questions coming through? I don't currently see any more questions. Uh, Okay. All right, so everyone, um, if there are no questions, then I would like to uh, move toward our closeout, but I want to give everybody a last shot. Any more questions? Well, everyone, please give a round of applause to Zachary Mannheimer. Um, if you can't come off mute, at least do it quietly where you are. <laughs> but I do want to appreciate you for uh, this. It is very informative, um, and like I said, I, I just uh, I'm, I'm amazed at the work that you all do and the way that the industry is going. Um, and I look forward to speaking to you further, uh, even after uh, this webinar. So I'm going to now turn it over uh, to Larry to do our closeout. But Zachary, I appreciate it. And Larry, you're up. All right. Well, thank thank you, Zach. This is uh, fantastic. I think I saw mind blowing uh, come through uh, the chat. Um, it was a very efficient, very uh, informational, inform informationally packed uh, uh, webinar, and we really appreciate that. Um, I, you know, as a as a, um, a novice and long term kind of fan of the uh, 3D printing, and I was I was, was going to get up and get around and try to see if I couldn't find my old Raspberry Pi that I bought like you know 100 years ago. Um, you know, I'd like to see that the, the integration of uh, the technology uh, directed towards solving problems is, is uh, one of the big areas of application that, uh, you know, your company and technology is really focused towards. So i uh, really like to applaud you um, in this presentation. Fantastic. Now, uh, we went through the round of questions, but if anyone would like to contact, uh, you know, Zachary um, about more uh, about his company and, and maybe keep uh, pay, keep track on what you know where they are where their progress is what areas they you know areas in uh, the country that they might be uh, making some progress um, or advances in technology the training um, as it rolls out in different places um, you know please uh, contact you know Zachary and. Uh, there's a list, the rest of the list here is uh, government division leadership. That would be, include myself, uh, Larry Edwards is your chair, uh, Clinton Wilson is chair elect, Mark Burson is the past chair, uh, Sir Vincent Burris uh, as our programs chair, and please don't be afraid to reach out to Vincent about program, uh, program ideas, webinar ideas, um, and he will, uh, he will take that solicitation and See if we can't mix it into rotation. And to our illustrious media chair, uh, Ms. Neota Brown. Now, following this presentation, and uh, Vincent, I'll let you pipe up on the time frame of that. Uh, you will be receiving uh, your credits, you know, for your RUs. I believe it's uh, 0.1 RUs. What is the speculated time frame, Mr. Burris, that we would be issuing those RUs? That will be going out in the next 24 to 48 hours. All right, fantastic. And I believe uh, you, I think you uh, you might have a, a a presentation or two that might be coming up in the next month or two. Do do we have something yes. already slotted? Yeah. 
speak. All right, could you uh, speak to it? We have that coming up August the 11th. That will be with African Biologics and Vaccine, um, how the South African company helped to put together a pipeline to create the vaccine needed um, in an innovative manner, uh, building pretty much from very limited data to a robust pipeline um, around the public health. The, um, see, I'm on, not even on the camera. The uh, webinar itself will be a major focus on business continuity and pandemic preparedness and how what they consider, and they themselves, African considers what they call low to moderately income countries um, and how the work they've done can help to bolster and strengthen uh, the pandemic preparedness for those of high income countries um, and um, in their whole process around research and design is now a new thing at the forefront because they have a licensing uh, now with the National Institutes of Health as well as the National Institute for um, Allergy and Infectious Disease. And they would talk about those products and the work that they've done to help create the vaccine for South Africa. Fantastic. And that is in August. August 11th. August 11th. All right. Fantastic. And for more information about events of, of this uh, webinars of this magnitude or others, uh, including uh, our upcoming EDGE conference in November, November 1st and 2nd, uh, do please visit our website, uh, our MySQ website, um, uh, you know, we're under events and we will be having that listed. Uh, soon we'll also have uh, our prior or previous webinars, including this one, uh, listed on our MySQ government uh, website under videos, so uh, stay tuned. Keep checking back, you know, but it shouldn't be long uh, before we have that all there. Uh, but with that, I'd like to say uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you for coming out, and we hope to see you soon. Bye, everyone.